Hi, let's talk about heat transfer. There's three primary mechanisms of heat transfer. Radiation, which is energy transferring from one substance to another due to a temperature difference, but not through a physical medium. Two, conduction, where energy transfers through the same medium. Um, and three, convection, where we have generally air or water, i.e. a fluid, a thing that can move, that is involved in conveying the energy from point A to point B. When we talk about uh, cooking food in an oven, <clears throat> we're actually looking at all three of these forms of heat transfer. Let's break it down mechanism by mechanism, looking at the oven in particular. So here, let's imagine we've got a oven uh, that's electric, although this works just as well for a gas oven. And so we have a uh, element that we can see is red hot uh, in the middle and or in the top and in the bottom. And in the middle, we have the tray on which our food would rest. First, considering what happens with radiation. All of these cues with a little dot on top mean rate of heat transfer. So it's kind of like heat energy per minute, for example. And first, looking at radiation, what are the things we have here? Well, we have an area, that's what that capital A is. And in this case, this, uh, as is also the case in convection, means the area of our food that is exposed uh, to this heat transfer mechanism. So when we are thinking about crackers, I'm going to draw kind of an orthogonal view, view of a big sheet of crackers here before we start to cook it. There it is. Now, when, it, uh, when we talk about that area for radiation and for convection heat transfer, we're really talking about the big flat surface area that is facing, in the case of radiation, our red hot heating element up top. That's the area that is relevant here. That's also the area that is relevant for convection because it is the area that is exposed to uh, the air as the air is moving around inside the oven. So these two areas uh, are the same. And if you're making a big sheet of crackers, um, it's the area of the entire cookie sheet. Uh, this F here in radiation tells us about how much of the food that we're putting in the oven can see, I've got quotes around C, that heating element. So if you're only cooking one sh uh, cookie sheet worth of crackers and you stick it in the oven, uh, that F is all the way up as big as it can be to one because it is completely exposed to the heating element. But if instead you're using two or three or four trays and they are blocking each other, um, it might be one for the top tray and much, much smaller for the subsequent ones. And you can probably see this, right? When you want to brown something in the oven, what do you do? You put it on the top rack as close to the heating element as possible um, and let that go. All right, what else is going on here? We have another constant. This is called the Stefan Boltzmann constant, uh, constant. And we're just, I just need you to know that it is a, uh, a constant that rules this situation. And we are going to throw the star of simplicity at it and let it sit right there. It's uh, something that we could determine a value for uh, and use. The next bit though, that is really important is this here. Radiation heat transfer depends on the relative temperatures, just like all the other heat transfer mechanisms, but here they're raised to the fourth power. So when you have something at a very, very high temperature, uh, like a red hot uh, oven element, it's capable of throwing quite a lot of energy in the direction of your baked goods, um, which are at a much lower temperature. But it has to be able to see them. So radiation uh, turns out to be important um, uh, a little bit in all cases in an oven, but a lot uh, for when you have only one thing or that thing is on top um, and 
uh, facing the uh, red hot elements in your oven. If you want to do an experiment with radiative heat transfer, I recommend uh, finding yourself a campfire and roasting a marshmallow and roasting it, you know, not in the way I like to roast it, which is just to set it on fire, but to uh, circle it gently in the presence of um, the, uh, the fire uh, till it browns. And that is happening due to radiative heat transfer, um, um, especially if you hold it off to the side, but where it is exposed to the radiation. All right, next. Let's talk about, actually, I'm going to do this in a slightly different order. Let's talk about convection. Convection, uh, we have, again, we need that surface area. And again, oh, look at this. We have a constant. It's a different constant. And this constant has to do with how fast the air in our oven is moving around um, and the, uh, the shape of uh, what we've put in the oven and a few other things. So we're gonna just start that with simplicity and say, well, it's a constant. It's not even really constant actually, but be that as it may. And this depends uh, on a temperature difference, but it's between the fluid, so in this case, the air that's in the oven, and then the temperature of the item that we are cooking. In this case, that's the temperature of our crackers. You'll notice if you're thinking uh, about this, that the temperature of the crackers changes over time. So this is not a constant um, because as, uh, as we leave the baked good in the oven, its temperature goes up. So less energy comes in in this fashion uh, over time, which makes sense. I guess that's also true with radiation. It's just uh, because uh, we're taking to the fourth power the temperature of the heating element that is such a big number relative to what else is uh, going on that uh, it pretty much swamps the change. But this one, uh, the difference is much more noticeable. Finally, we have conduction. Conduction, we talked about before. I used a different equation for it before. The equation I used for it before had this uh, fancy triangle, you know, upside down triangle in it um, to designate gradient. Uh, and that was because I wanted to show that conduction, which is heat transfer through a solid medium, uh, could act, can happen in all directions. It doesn't just go from point A to point B, it goes from wherever is hotter to wherever is colder in whichever directions that happens to be. So it could be traveling sideways and up and down and back and forth all at once. In this case, because what we're, work, what we're looking at is a big flat slab uh, that is very thin relative to uh, how long it is and how wide it is, uh, we can really think of this heat transfer in terms of one direction only. And that one direction in this case is the direction between the top and the bottom. So the very thin direction of the cracker. Okay. And so uh, now we can look at this um, heat transfer in terms of, oh, look, yet again, a constant. And here we have a difference between the temperature on say uh, where energy is moving from. So perhaps that's the cookie sheet or the outside edge of the cracker and uh, the temperature where the energy is moving to. So in this case, that would probably be the interior of the cracker. And that is over the distance, which is uh, probably the thickness of the cracker. Or if we imagine this as happening symmetrically, energy is coming in from the top, energy is coming up from the bottom, it's then just half the thickness of the cracker, if it's symmetrical. And look, we have our friend surface area again, except it's not surface area. That's why I put a little star on it. This uh, conduction doesn't need a surface to be going through, it just needs the area that it's moving through. Since we decided that this was talking about the thickness, um, in this case, this area is the area that's perpendicular to that thickness, and that area is uh, the surface area of the cracker. It's the identical area, but it doesn't have to be, so that's why it's got a little star. And again, there's a constant. This constant we're gonna come back to talking about because it's uh, a little bit fishy especially in this case. Um, 
Sometimes you'll find engineers refer to things as constants uh, when they aren't really, you know, and uh, this is a big case where that's going to happen. So let's go look at all of this in action, how this comes together. So let's look at what's happening in the oven. So here I have represented a cookie sheet and sitting on this cookie sheet is our uncooked cracker. And we've turned on the oven and so everything is happening all at once. And uh, part of what I want you to think about is how cooking is in part a race between different mechanisms of heat transfer. So we have the radiation, which is pretty much mostly impacting the top surface. Why is it not impacting the bottom surface? Because the cookie sheet's in the way. Uh, and when the cookie sheet is doing uh, energy transfer to our cracker, that's going to be conduction. We also have convection that is uh, imparting energy uh, also through the surfaces, again, through the top surface, possibly through the bottom surface, through the cookie sheet. And then, well, where is conduction? So conduction uh, is going to be represented in green, and we're going to see it in the zoomed in view over here on the right. We have conduction moving from the cookie sheet into the cracker or whatever baked good we're making. And then it's also how energy is moving uh, inside uh, the cracker itself from its upper surface towards the interior. So what do we need to be thinking about here? Uh, I mentioned this is a bit of a race. We are racing convection and radiation uh, and conduction. And what do I mean by this race? Well, uh, our cracker will go from raw to cooked, uh, not all at once, but as a result of some certain amount of energy, so uh, some quantity of energy, I'm going to summarize that as E, um, being imparted to each element of the cracker, right? So E is what needs to get there for us to consider this food cooked. And how E is getting there is from the combination of convection, radiation, and conduction. But convection and radiation are just bringing energy to the surface. They are only getting stuff out here on the edges. Whereas conduction is the one and only thing we got, sort of, and I'll explain the sort of in a moment, that gets to the interior. And I noticed the discussion and the discussion board was along the lines of, hey, if you turn the oven temperature up too high, you get a burnt exterior and a raw interior. And that sort of experience is a result of these uh, factors in cooking playing off of each other. So I said it was a little complicated, because remember, I said conduction uh, had to do with K, this constant um, uh, times the area times the temperature difference, which I'm going to write as delta T uh, over a difference in length. So that is, for example, in this particular case, as drawn here, this would be your delta X coming to that center line of the cracker, and the delta T would be uh, whatever the temperature is on the outside edge here to the inside edge. Now, what's going on? Well, this changes over time, right? The temperature on the exterior is probably going up due to convection and radiation. The temperature on the interior line, we want to be going up also. So, uh, so that's going to make this a little bit messy over time. But what is happening is the temperature goes up. Like, what's the point of all this, right? We are trying to cook it. It is going from raw to cooked. And that actually means your constant is changing. It's changing as it goes because that, that uh, coefficient is a different value for something that is raw, something that's in the middle, something that's cooked. So uh, it makes modeling this 
a, uh, a real bear if you want to uh, plan it all out. And often it's just easier to do the experiment. But backing up to uh, the Im uh, impact of thickness, that delta X talks about how thick the cracker is. And looking at uh, what we're modeling here, remember that is all equal to the rate of energy transfer, the rate of heat transfer. So if uh, this gets bigger, then the rate is going to get smaller, right? It's got further to go to uh, get to the middle and get that cooked. In the meantime, radiation happens faster uh, as you have uh, that greater temperature difference to the fourth power. Um, and convection is tootling right along. So it is uh, by turning up the temperature to a very great degree, you end up with, well, you get a nice temperature on the outside, but you might not drive this movement of energy, the conduction movement of energy, uh, sufficiently more rapidly relative to how much energy is coming in from radiation. Because remember, that's got a T for the heating element to the fourth power. So a little change there makes a big change in radiation, whereas that same change uh, has a much smaller impact over here on our friend conduction. So uh, this would tend to argue that uh, we have a few choices if we want to end up with stuff that's cooked in the middle and not raw in the middle while being not burnt on the outside. Uh, so one approach that we could do is a low oven. A low oven means radiation is not a big deal. It gives us plenty of time for a heat transfer to occur and get everything cooked without necessarily getting the outside burnt. You're going to see on the next slide, low oven is not always uh, what we want to do. So alternately, maybe you go thin food. <laughs> because if we have thin food, this uh, the impact of conduction is very, very, very small, right? If we make this so that that delta X is as close to nothing as possible, the heat transfer will be very, very, very fast. So uh, thin food, possibly way to go. Uh, and that way, uh, it's almost impossible for the burning due to other things to happen because it's cooked on the inside so rapidly. Finally, let's talk about how all of this heat transfer is connected with the leavening in the crackers. Crackers can be leavened uh, by baking soda and baking powder. And looking at the uh, crackers in my own home, I think that this is the most common form for commercial crackers, although that is also connected to steam. Steam is undeniably playing a part whether or not it is uh, incorporated as the only thing to happen here because we have water in the dough and that water is turning into steam as we go. So those two things are working together. Uh, you can use yeast at home. Yeast tends not to be used commercially because it just takes too long and there's other things that work as well. Uh, historically, though, so if you are going to look for a thing that's like a cracker, that goes back hundreds of years, baking soda and baking powder are somewhat newer inventions. They're coming in uh, into commercial use in the 1800s. And if you want to go before that, you are definitely looking at yeast. Uh, you are looking at steam. And uh, also in the uh, 1800s, coming into the early 1900s, we had uh, ammonium, I believe chloride, which uh, when heated gives you ammonia gas. Um, yeah, that's the same stuff you like could clean with. So ammonia gas, uh, like it worked apparently really well for nice airy crackers. The downside is if you get a whiff of that gas in concentrated form, uh, it's bad for you. And it leaves a flavor that's not so great unless it uh, all completely aerates. So I would say we're, uh, we're gonna pass on that one
and we'll just think about these other ones, primarily uh, baking soda and baking powder. So we have a cracker. It's got baking soda and baking powder um, that will chemically react and give us CO2. Um, it also has some moisture in it, which may turn into steam. And both of these things uh, will be in play anytime we stick this in the oven. So let's use our zoom in for a moment and take a look at this. Here are the tiny little bubbles that are already in the dough from our process of mixing. And that's really important that those are there. Uh, we'll get into that again in a future class. Uh, but as we have put this into the oven, um, as steam forms, it is looking for a way out of the system, right? So here is, here is steam forming and steam uh, can move into a variety of places. One, it can end up in the tiny little bubbles, making them bigger, which makes this a lighter and airier product. Um, but if we get too much water in there, it'll be wet inside there, which means our cracker won't be crispy. Uh, the steam can just escape through the surface, which undoubtedly some of it does, um, but maybe not enough of it. And obviously, if you're in a position where this uh, water is near the bottom, it can't get out of the bottom because that's where the cookie sheet is. And so this comes to uh, something that you've noticed and came up in the concept of crackers, the idea of docking. What is docking? Well, if we look at the cracker, here's the cracker sheet as viewed from the top. And if you look at, say, Cheez-Its or saltines or uh, pie crust that you make at home, um, somebody's poked it with a fork. So there's all these little holes in it. And what are those holes for? Those are water escape pods. So here's, here's a duct hole as seen from the side. And the water can go into that if it uh, can't manage to diffuse to the surface over the course of cooking, it can probably get to one of these holes, and that's what it does. So that helps us dry things out a little bit and um, lessen the impact of the water. If we have the baking soda and the baking powder. Those are reacting to form carbon dioxide, and the baking powder in particular reacts at uh, higher temperatures. Uh, and baking soda by itself, not in the presence of acid, will also thermally decompose when it gets up over 200 degrees, which this cracker may indeed do. So uh, both of those, so again, we can imagine here inside our cracker, we have some baking soda mixed in, baking powder. Baking powder is best thought of as baking soda star of simplification, because there's a few different approaches to this, but it's baking soda that's been mixed with a solid acid. And the solid acid is constructed in such a way that it thermally decomposes when the temperature is high enough. The problem with using baking soda by itself is the second it hits water, it hits acid, it starts to react. And that might be before you've got the food in the oven. Whereas baking powder, that acid base reaction between the sodium bicarbonate and whatever the solid acid is won't really start happening till elevated temperature. So uh, we have this gas popping out and filling and expanding the little bubbles we had in there to begin with, and also a fair amount of it can escape both through the docking and through the surface. So what the heck does all of this have to do with the comparison to a low oven over longer time versus thin food in a, in a really high oven. Well, first, let's talk about steam. If you are using steam as a significant part of your leavening mechanism, a low oven will uh, not tend to generate that steam very rapidly, which means that the water is going to try and be leaving the system uh, later on in the cooking process. And that means that perhaps the surface will have dried out already by this point, and you'll get cracks in the surface, and you won't really have the opportunity for the little uh, bubbles that you have trapped in your food to grow that much, because parts of it will already be set. So that's no good. So the low oven <coughs> for a long time 
works for things you don't want browned, works for things that cook primarily by denaturation, um, but doesn't tend to work beautifully for things that we want to be uh, puffy. Uh, on the other hand, if we work with a thinner food and a higher temperature uh, to avoid uh, burning, um, what do we get? Rapid reaction, where this uh, water turns into steam, where the uh, baking powder releases its CO2. Uh, that reaction happens very rapidly. Those bubbles grow very rapidly, and um, they happen early enough in the process. The temperature gets high enough early enough in the process that those uh, fluffy bubbles can be created and trapped before the food gets too set, so we can get a nice surface. And so this is what we tend to do uh, for uh, crackers. Um, when you're making a cookie, uh, a lot of the aeration, you're not generally trying to make the cookies very, very fluffy. Uh, they already have a fair number of air bubbles in them, so you just don't want those air bubbles to go away. Um, so we end up with something in the middle. And uh, for an oven, or not for an oven, for a loaf of bread, um, we are okay, in fact, with having the surface have a very different texture and water content than the interior. So it's all right that uh, some of what's going on is, um, is not going to be hot enough to create necessarily a, a trapping of steam uh, that would work with baking soda and baking powder, uh, because of course, in that case with the bread, we have yeast making the bubbles. Alrighty then, that was a lot. Catch you later.